everybody. It's Dr. Lori. This is Ask Dr. Lori Live. Get your questions ready. I'm going to answer them. And um, don't forget to sign up for new my newsletter. If you're new to the channel and you haven't signed up yet, sign up. And it's easy to do. All you have to do is go to drlorivee.com. Look for the thumbs up free, right? Because the newsletter is free. And the most recent newsletter that's coming out, oh, give me, give us your email address. We'll send the newsletter to you. It's easy to do. Um, if you're new to the channel, if you're not new to the channel, you just haven't signed up yet, you're going to want this newsletter. Why? Because I'm going to show you tips on negotiating and how to get a better deal. And everybody wants a better deal. I'm going to show you how you do it. And if you're, oh, I'm afraid. Oh, I can't do it. Oh, I'm nervous. Oh, okay. All right, we'll get past all that. I'll show you in the newsletter. So my questions are here from all over. Just type them right in there to the comments, into the chat area, and I'm going to take your questions now. I don't care if they're personal. I don't care if they're art, antiques, collecting, values, the markets, what's hot, what's not, whatever you want. Um, hi to Pottstown, Pennsylvania, and uh, Tennessee, Tennessee. I have family who are vacationing in Tennessee this week, and Arizona, too. That's great. Must so It's going to be uh, a great, great show let's see what you've got questions from you now how do we safely ship breakable things like glass and pottery okay if you have a vessel like any of the pieces that are here on the table you have to not only everybody's focusing on supporting the outside you've got to support the inside right so when it comes to pieces like glass pieces like pottery bowls and such you got to make sure that you put something inside of it wrapped up paper whatever it might be it's also a good idea to actually create sort of a uh, a box if you will it doesn't have to be an actual box but create a bottom to it but make sure that you put something in here because if there is a force up against it there's something that actually protects the interior of the object as well and the other way you protect breakable things it's a little thing called insurance <laughs> you should get it you should make sure that your buyers get it because it's really important. You should always insure the pieces before they leave you. Make sure that you have tracking and all that good stuff. And uh, of course, that's one of the things you want to think about. I do have a video where I talk about how to ship stuff. So you can watch that video right here on the channel. There's a lot of information also about these types of things on my website under research. The research tab is right there. So can you give us a clue about your collaboration with Lone Fox? Um, I can't talk very much about the collaborations, but I am having co collaborations and um, I really enjoy the collaborations with great, great folks. So I'm excited about that particular collaboration that we've done together. Um, I think it's really a, a very, very cool, um, innovative um, designer. And I've collaborated with lots of cool people. And I will talk more about that. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the show. But um, I'll talk more about collaborations and a busy week that I had. I had a very busy week. Um, it's good to see, uh, of course, many of our regulars who have been with me for years and years following. Um, but a lot of things happening, interviews with, um, you know, magazines about things like uh, coffee grinders and splatterware, which is one of my favorites. Uh, I have a question about marbles. Are they valuable? Yeah, marbles can be valuable. And I've spoken about marbles in lots of the live shows as well as on my website. Um, you have to look for certain attributes. I always tell you things in lists, right? Because this is all about lists. So uh, when you're looking at marbles, I want you to look for size. I want you to look for color. I want you to look for uh, conformity of the glass, right? I want you to make sure it looks like it looks pretty good, right, in terms of the shape. Um, I also want you to look for elements like a Lutz swirl, right? I want you to look for certain kinds of aspects of those particular marbles. Um, some of them very valuable, some of them pretty run of the mill, but a lot of people collect marbles. Glass in general is a very, very popular collectible, and it could be something like a glass bowl or a glass pendant or a glass marble or a glass paperweight or perfume bottle, whatever it might be, lists of some of the glass things that people collect. But when it comes to marbles, that's what you're looking for. Thank you, Jan, and I'm glad you're addicted. I like it. I like to hear that. The show is a lot of fun. So um, a couple of things, resale market for glass, particularly, I think you said depression glass. Depression glass has held its value very well for a long time in the manner similar to carnival glass or iridescent glass. Now, some people collect by color. Some people collect by pattern or shape. Um, some people just like to have, you know, accent pieces on it. If you're looking at depression glass, I want you to look for the makers, the particular names, right? And actually on my website, there's an article about the makers of 
particular types of glass and which ones you should look for. So I want you to look for the makers. I want you to look for, of course, unusual pieces, pieces that are not run of the mill. You know, everybody's got a dinner plate kind of thing. I want you to look for the unusual or the rare pieces, pieces that might be serving pieces, pieces that might be, you know, sort of more one of a kind that they didn't make in large numbers. I want you to also look for particular colors. Yes, color is important. And of course, a little bit of age. Condition will drive the market. Condition is always important. So it has to be in good shape. If it's scratched up from knives, if it has chips, if it's got some other prime, uh, cracks or problems, that's what you don't want to look for. So color, manufacturer or maker, um, pattern, and then of course, unusual pieces. That's your list for what you're looking for. Cause I'm giving you the roadmap for when you're at the flea market, the yard sale, the antique mall, or of course the thrift store. So that's what I want you to, to think about. Um, yeah, people love lists. I love lists. It's easy. And you know, I've taught for a long, long time. You know, I've been an appraiser for 25 or more years, but I have to say that having been a university professor, one of the things that would help you is if you could have a list, if you could see it in your mind's eye. This is why I repeat so much. I repeat stuff because I want you to get it. Once you repeat it, you'll go, oh, I know that. I know that. Even if you only remember one or two things of the list, then you can add the other things. You can, of course, rewatch the videos or, of course, download it too. Are signed and number serographs worth much? Well, yeah. I mean, signed and number serographs, it depends on who the artist is with the serograph. So are you talking about Andy Warhol or, you know, some other printer, right? And it could be really serographs. You want, again, low numbers. You always want a signature and you actually want two signatures on a serograph. You want one that's called in the plate. Looks like it's part of the print. And then you want one that's pencil signed or ink signed that doesn't look like it's part of the print. So if you're looking for serographs and you want to know which ones are valuable, here's what you look for. Serographs or silk screens, look for an overlay of color, right? So the red overlays the green, for example, or it butts right up against another color. So they're basically, that's how the process works, silk screening or seriography. You also want to look for the artist. A different artists will command different amounts of value, right? Different money. Then you want to also look for signed and numbered. I like double signed, right? I like it signed in the plate. I like it also signed by pencil or ink, right? Could be magic marker too. A Sharpie is not a bad thing, you know, in the 21st century, but that's what you're looking for. Lower numbers are always better. I don't care if it's numerator denominator, a lot lower numbers, right? Because you want a, a small print run that's indicated by the lower, the number underneath, of course, that line, or what would be, of course, the denominator if we were doing math class fractions. Um, that's what you want to look for. Those are some of the lists for those. So remember, do you need a certificate of authenticity? Here's the thing about a certificate of authenticity. You need an appraisal, okay? Because the certificates of authenticity sometimes are only signed by the person who sold it. So people go, well, who, said, who signed this piece? Um, so again, you do not need a certificate of authenticity per se to sell a, to sell a serograph. You do need an appraisal and you need an appraisal close to the time when you're going to sell it. Right. And the reason for that is you need to know what the current market is. Right. So that's what you're looking for there seriography and prints in general, you know, people who, who collect prints and who know prints and who know art can recognize whether or not you have a real piece or a fake piece. And I'll teach you how to tell the reels from the fake, the real from the fake too. So don't forget, that's what you're looking for. Thank you very much for your super chats and super stickers that helps to support the channel. It helps me to make more videos that help you. And when you do that, it tells me, you know what? She's been helping me. I, I want to support Dr. Lori because she's been helping. Can original monotypes be worth something? Yes. Monotypes, right? So they're usually prints, but there's usually mono, right? That idea of having a monotype for one hand monotype or, or in fact, one particular example of one image, uh, they can definitely work, be worth something. Sometimes they're worth more than some of the more, uh, uh, what would I say? Sometimes a monotype is actually worth more than the more highly recognizable print, right? Because not everybody has it. So it's this idea of uniqueness or one of a kind. So that's what you're looking for. But anytime it's a print, it's a reproduction, right? But again, if you have a monotype, that is a good piece. And usually you will be able to command some money for it. Monotypes are introduced very early on in print in the printmaking process. So yeah, really terrific. Really terrific. I think if you can get an original monotype, hang on to it. It's good. Good question, too. Thank you, Ezekiel.
Thank you for the super stickers. And it does help me. And I like to say thank you. So Roro, thank you very much for the super stickers and the super chats. Um, again, whatever you do to support the channel, if that's you watch the channel, if that's you do something at the tip jar on our website, if it's, oh, I bought a Dr. Lori mug, you know, I went and I decided to buy a Dr. Lori mug or a sweatshirt or a, or a t-shirt or a fanny pack or whatever you want. Um, you know, those particular pieces of merchandise also will assist in, in supporting the channel. I do get compensation when you do that. That compensation goes into a, a kitty for, of course, more videos for you guys. Um, don't forget that th these questions are anything. It's, it's open full game, right? Yeah, Viking glass, Becky, can be valuable. It will depend on which pieces. It will depend on if you have full sets. You know, I like sets, okay? And I like sets because most people say if I can get this in one-stop shopping, if I can get everything that I need in one-stop shopping, sets are great, right? And the set might be small. It might be only one or two pieces, but at least more than a set of at least two pieces is going to command some interest. So, yes, Viking glass can be valuable. Glass has done very, very well in the market of late. And when I say that, maybe of the last, you know, um, I would say year and a half to 18 months, done very well. So a lot of people love glass. I got two Roseville pieces signed with a mold number for $25. Okay. Is there anything else I should look for to be sure it's authentic? Yeah, there's a lot you should look for. Look, uh, for Roseville, I want you to look at the glaze. I want you to look at the colors. I want you to look at the type of flower form or type of plant that might be represented on your piece of Roseville. And some Roseville doesn't have flowers, but more common ones do. I want you to look for the the um, the uh, USA on the bottom. I want you to look for the word Roseville. I want you to look for the earlier Roseville marks, right? They're not always the same. They change the mark throughout their, their history. And I also want you to look for the size. There's usually a um, number like five and a little a quote sign for inches on the bottom of a Roseville piece. I want you to look for that too. If that's missing, you may not have an authentic. Remember, Roseville was reproduced in large numbers, so there are a lot of fakes out there. But when you're looking for it, there's your list for Roseville, right? You want to look for the mold number. You want to look for the type of flowers. You want to look for the color of the ceramic and the glaze. You want to also look for that inch sign, inches sign, that number at the bottom. It's usually on the underside. Make sure if it says eight inches, it is eight inches, right? And um, of course, condition will always impact the value. I want you to know, I want you to succeed. It's really quite simple. I'm not one of these, these YouTubers who wants, you know, to compete with you. I want you to succeed. That's why I'm trying to teach you all of this. I've been doing this for a long time with a PhD in the field and museum experience and experience as an appraiser. I've evaluated 50,000 objects a year for the last 25 years or so. So, you know, this really is something that I can provide a lot of information about a lot of different objects. I love all of it. You know, if you can't tell I love all of it, I love all of it. I think it's totally cool. It's the study of people and the stuff that they made throughout history. It's very interesting. I talked to a lot of video callers today and my gosh, I mean, I heard so many wonderful stories today about how they're enjoying the, the channel and they're learning so much and they're just having fun because they're learning a great community you know, you're all pretty cool. <laughs> it's a great community, the whole bunch of you. So thank you for watching. Can a large piece of Murano swirl ever be unmarked and on an upside down U clear base? Okay, Jill, I got to see this piece, right? Because you're describing it and I'm sure you're trying to describe it as well as you can. But in fact, I need to see it. Is it easy for you to send me a picture? Yes. Murano pieces of swirl can be unmarked. Now, of course, everybody prefers them to be marked, right? Because then you're saying, okay, well, I've got a mark here and I've got some provenance to go with it kind of thing. But if you have an unusual mark, don't poo-poo it. Don't go, oh, it's unusual and I don't know and I can't find it online. Because remember what happens with online. There are people online who are putting things up as if it's gospel and they may not know any more than you do. You know, not that you don't know stuff, but in fact, they may not have the information either. So don't always rely on what you find online. You need a reliable source is the situation. Um, so go to drlorivee.com. Right there on the homepage, there are three little buttons. One of them says, send a photo, get report. Click on that circle with the camera button right there. Click on it. It's going to take you to a form. Fill out the form to the best of your ability. Attach a photo, and I will tell you whether or not um, what you've got, you know, I'll, I'll go through the process of, is it worth your time? Is it not worth your time? That kind of thing. So 
Uh, it's a good idea to send me a photo for those particular pieces. Try to get a good photo. You can do it and have a clear background. I say this all the time. Can you have a plain background? You know, don't take it with five other pieces on the table, you know, like all the Glidden American pottery that's on my table here today. You know, take it. You want to show me one piece? Show me one piece. Show me a nice, clear photo. And look at the photo before you send it. <laughs> People go, oh, she is unapologetic. I am unapologetic. Show me, the, look at the picture yourself and see, think in your mind, ask yourself, do I, can I see this? And if you can see it clearly, then I probably can see it clearly. But don't just take the photo and send it off to me without taking a look at it. Take the, the nanosecond and take a look before you send it to me. Is there any value in pottery sound but not numbered? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Studio art pottery can be signed and not numbered, of course. Not, you might be... You might be getting confused between manufactured pottery, right? Pottery that's done the big manufacturing um, firms or factories versus the smaller, the smaller, of course, um, studio artists who might be making a very, very small number of pieces. So it doesn't necessarily have to be numbered. It can only be signed and it can be worth a lot. We've seen that. I've, we've seen these examples on, of course, on the shows here with Ask Dr. Lori Live. We've also seen them on Real Bargains and also in my rants and raves. This is why I do these videos. Is there any brass that's worth more than others? Oh, yes, yes. So if you have brass in general, there's a, a process known as brazing, which actually is where um, they would literally create sort of a, 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 a film or a texture on top of another piece of base metal. Um, brass in its forms, different forms of brass are more valuable. S brass sculptures are more valuable than others. Now, others might be, you know, an inexpensive piece of glass, piece of brass, excuse me, an inexpensive piece of brass, like a small brass, uh, maybe like a small brass plate, small uh, size. But yes, so, and brass and copper and meta metals in general are really making a big comeback. Why? I don't know what it was. Maybe 10 years ago, I said, you know, metals are going to come back big. Why was that? Because it's a revival of the look of the 1970s. And we're at 50 years after the 1970s. The 50 year cycle in design, the 50 year cycle in collecting is something that is responsible for brass coming back into widespread use and seeing the market go up for it. So that's what you're looking at. Vintage acrylic purse worth anything. Holy moly. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, vintage lucite, vintage acrylic, vintage plastics, purses in general are worth a lot. And when I say a lot, I'm well into the hundreds of uh, the hundreds and upper hundreds of dollars quickly, fast. So you want to look for those. What kinds of purses should you be looking for? Beaded purses, handmade purses, uh, lucite purses with um, a contrasting material handle, right? Um, Purses that relate to a mid-century modern look, so oftentimes they kind of look like buckets, okay? Purses with a, either a, a designer name, for example, beadwork purses, metal mesh purses. Um, sometimes they're carpet bag purses, which are textile. And of course, all the leathers that you've been thinking of, you know, the coaches, the Pradas, the Givenchy, all of them. You know, all of those are going to be. So purses, yes, if you see a person, it's in pretty good shape. I don't care what it is. I don't care what name it is. Pick it up. Thrift store purses, yes. Um, acrylic, specifically. So, Lori, thank you very much for always supporting. If any of you watch all the time, you might see some of these people who always support. Whether it's with a lot of a lot of a big uh, a big number value or um, a small amount, and it doesn't matter to me. Here's what matters to me: you're showing me your appreciation. That's what matters. That you're saying, hey. This woman is helping me and I know that she wants to help me and the videos are helping me and I watch them. A lot of you have been telling me, especially the newbies, you know, I call them the newbies because they're new to the channel. They just found they're very excited and it's fun. And I also talked on a video call today. I had a 30 minute video call with um, a couple and they said, oh, Dr. Lori, you know, you know, I watched you for the last two years and it's still so much fun. I just love this. And it's so fun to see the excitement when you start to understand what quality looks like. And that's what I'm trying to do for you. Now, there are many of you who are saying, um, many of you who are saying, um, gee, Dr. Lori, I need to declutter. I'm ready to cash out, for example. And I also help with, of course, downsizing and decluttering. Why? For years and years and years doing, of course, appraisals for folks who are saying, I have too much or I want to basically streamline my collecting. What was that about chicken? Well, 
We're having barbecue chicken. Oh, that's good. You like a sweet or spicy? What do I like in barbecue cooking? I don't like things that are too spicy. Like I can eat a little bit of heat, but I don't like too spicy, right? So I'm usually like, if I was having chicken wings, which I try not to have any of those because they're fried, right? So you have to be careful of that for my weight. But um, I would say, I don't, I usually offer, order a mild barbecue sauce, but I don't like it too sugary either. So, I mean, I'm kind of difficult. <laughs> kind of difficult. I hope you enjoy your dinner, Don. It was great to meet you in the class. And of course, my classes are up. Many of you are, didn't know I have whole classes. The classes are so much fun. Um, so it's two hours. It's a lot of fun. And um, classes are open. You can basically choose what class date you want and you can join all of us. It's great to be with part of the community because you know, my class members are cool. And of course I'm there for two hours to help you to understand about art antiques collecting and values and identification. Cause that's really what it is. Identification, authentication to learn what you've got. Is old Avon jewelry worth acquiring? Well, yes, yes. Old Avon jewelry, particularly the Avon jewelry that have the little logo tags, right? Uh, thank you, Carol. I'm so glad you're here, and I'm glad you love the class. I loved it, too. We had a great time. Um, and Carol had a great piece in the class, too. Uh, some of you might even find out that you have a real bargain you weren't you weren't sure of. But, um, for example, Avon, when you're looking at Avon costume jewelry, here are a couple of things. I like the logo tag, okay? So look for the logo tag on costume jewelry by Avon. I like their gold pieces as well as their silver-toned metal pieces, right? Um, I like their classic styles. You know, they have like a herringbone necklace, pretty classic on, for, by Avon. Um, usually it holds up pretty well over time. Um, what else do I would I say about when you're looking for Avon? Um, look for less is more when it comes to Avon. I think that their classic pieces, their more plain pieces, are a little bit more attractive than when they start to try to do a design thing because they kind of try to do a lot in one. So Avon. Sarah Coventry, what are some of the names on that particular echelon? I'd say Avon, Sarah Coventry um, are, and you know, and at times Marvella uh, are pretty nice pieces that you can find pretty cheap. We've seen that with costume jewelry in a certain sort of tier of the costume jewelry pieces. You know, I'm not talking about the Trafaris and the Ben Amoons here. I'm talking sort of a little bit lower in, in terms of it. Stephanie, nice to see you. I hope you're learning a lot. There's a very God mama. I like that too. It's nice to see you. I, I hope you're all learning. And what I really appreciate is those of you who have been with me for a long time, who are helping out, who are going, hey, you know, you want to get on Dr. Lori's live show so you can show her an, an object. You know, you know, you have to have a good connection. You know, you have to have a plain background. You know, you can't have a million pictures of your grandkids behind you. Yeah. But the, the but some of our established community members are helping. They're saying, hey, this is how you do it. I've been a newbie before too. And uh, Dr. Lori's happy to answer questions from you. So feel free. Do you have a beginner's class? Yes, every class is a beginner's class. If you have no experience, you know, the class will help you. Yes. So it doesn't have to be beginners. You can do this. You can do this. I mean, I don't, you know, to me, I always think we're all beginners. We're all trying to help each other. So you just sign up for the class and I'll make sure I take care of you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> There's a lot to learn. There's a lot to learn, but it's so much fun. And when you choose what you like, right, and the types of pieces that you're looking for, you'll do fine. If you're thinking about, you know, um, have you heard of Richard Peeler Pottery? I have. Now, that's the kind of question. Here's the point. It's fine that she wanted to ask that question, but I have heard about, you know, a lot of a lot of artists, a lot of people, a lot of, of course, um, in all different echelons of create of the creative work, right? So when she does that. There's maybe one other person who might be interested in Richard Peeler pottery too, but the majority of you are like, okay, I don't care about that question. So I really want your questions. Don't be upset, Miss Thorma, hang on. I do want your questions to be sort of the types of questions that everybody can benefit from. But Miss Thorma, you can actually go to my website, click on that, that brown button, that circular button right there on the home page with the camera that says, you know, send a photo, get a report. Click on that, fill out that form, send me a photo, and I'll help you with your specific question. But for, for these shows, I like you to give me questions that are a little bit sort of broader so everybody can learn something from it. But I understand. It's a good question. It's fine. Yes, I can help you with that particular pottery question um, just in another format. So that's how we've set it up. We've set it out so, so everybody can basically get the information that they need. What crystal will most likely have a revival besides Lalique or Baccarat? 
Okay, I don't think Lalique or Baccarat are going to need to have a revival. Let me say that. So your question I want to kind of reword a little bit. Because those big brand names like Lalique, Baccarat, San Luis, Murano, those big names aren't really going to go out of style. It's whether or not you can get the right piece for the right price, that kind of thing. So if you're thinking about crystal and you want crystal, I want you to look for a couple of things. The heavier, the better. You know, I don't say that on the scale in the morning, but the heavier, the better when it comes to crystal. I like clarity. I want it to be clear. I like to see those big names. I want to see Saint Louis. I want to see Lalique. I want to see Baccarat. So I want to see those particular very well-known brand names um, when I'm looking at, at pieces of crystal. Um, I like to see significant size in terms of uh, a vase, for example. So you get a whole bouquet of roses, which of course I get from my suitors all the time. There's roses coming in here all the time. <laughs> I wish that were true, but big, significant, right? In terms of the vases too. So really, really nice. And no tinging. Don't do this. Don't do this. And the reason you don't want to do this is you can damage the piece easily. And it doesn't really tell you much about quality. There's so many people say it tells you about quality. It really doesn't tell you much about quality. What it sounds like to your ear may sound different to somebody else's ear. It doesn't really speak to quality. So quality is going to be in the manufacturer. It's going to be in the brand name. It's going to be in the condition, size, clarity, and weight. Did you get that list? That was the crystal list. I mean, here it is. You want the information? Here it is. All you have to do is watch. Thank you for your super chats and super stickers. I grew up in New Haven, Connecticut, honey. You know what? Hockey teams. And I went to the University of Michigan, so I love the Michigan Wolverines. I love their hockey team. And um, it used to be the Hartford Whalers, right, when I was growing up. Um, I do like the Tampa teams. Um, because I've done a lot of work in Tampa and I followed them for a long time too. But I do love hockey. I think hockey is a lot of fun. I don't mind a, a, a fight in hockey. I mean, this is how it is, you know, that's part of it. And, and you know, if, if I were on the ice like that, working as hard as they do, I have some very good friends in Pittsburgh whose sons are excellent hockey players. I'm always excited by that. I have a good friend who I spoke to this week. Um, actually in Connecticut, who her son is uh, bound for Michigan hockey too. And yeah, I like hockey. I like any sport. I love baseball. I got to say, I love baseball. I love swimming. Um, Katie Ledecky, I can't believe her. I think she's fantastic. Um, I love swimming because I was a swimmer for a long time. But um, give me a sport. Whenever I go to a new city, I mean, this has been true of my life and travel for years and years. Whenever I go to a new, new city, I go to the museum. I got to go to the museum. And, you know, that's in my blood. But I always take in a sports event. Don't really care what it is. If it's tennis at Wimbledon, if it's, you know, I don't care if it's curling, if I'm in Norway or Iceland, it doesn't matter to me. I want to see, I want to see a sporting event. You know, I'm in Chicago and I go see the, you know, the Cubs. Uh, yeah, that's or the White Sox. I always do that. Uh, are Fenton glassware items going to decline in value? There's a lot of Fenton out there. So anytime the market gets flooded, right, you're going to see a lowering of the value, right? Um, but when you see a name like Fenton, you'll see that certain sort of certain lines might might reduce in value. But uh, this is why you have to be careful with respect to what you are actually collecting and you know, a lot of folks are going to be hurting those of you who are resellers if they are selling things too low. You know, so somebody doesn't know what they've got. They don't bother getting an appraisal and they just put something. Oh, I got it for a dollar at the thrift store. If I get five, I'm happy. They hurt you in the market. I got that Fenton piece and I got it for a buck and I only want five dollars out of, out of it. But it's worth 40. You know, they're hurting the whole market. So this is why you have to really identify and have me help you identify the market and where it's going to be valuable. So, well, I'll tell you about Atlanta. I spent many years in Atlanta doing a show called Auction Kings. I've done appraisal events, I want to say, every year for the last 10 in Atlanta, some private events, some public events. So, yes, I get to Atlanta and I get all over the country doing appraisal events if you want to check them out. My events page, which is at drlaurieview.com, it says appearances, then it says dates and locations. Click, click, and you'll see everything that I'm doing. Or you can see it right here on this page. You see events at the top above the search, hit events, or you can hit appearances and get to dates and locations. You can do it either way, and it will show you when I'm going to be in certain places. But yes, I get all over. Um, you know, and then we do this for those folks who, you know, who say, hey, you know what, maybe. 
You know, I'm not seeing that. Oh, Ro Ro, Sally's or Peppies. I'm a Peppies girl, honey. I like modern too. These are, for those of you who don't know New Haven, um, these are, of course, some of the very famous um, New Haven or New York style pizza joints um, in New Haven, Connecticut on Worcester Street. And uh, we grew up eating uh, Peppies. Sally's is excellent. There's nothing wrong with Sally's. There used to be a place called Tony and Lucille's. I don't know if you remember, there's a calzone that used to be there that was like delicious. I don't know. I got both thighs in those places. <laughs> right, right. I gained a lot of weight on pizza in New Haven. But yeah, I'm um, Peppies. I have to say I'm Peppies. So I'm preparing to sell my stuff for Mom's Estate. Yeah, see, this is, I can help you with this. Lots of vintage household, vintage sound equipment. Okay, that could sell very, very well in places like eBay. Hummel figurines, look out because I'm coming at you with more information about Hummel. Do not, do not pass go, collect $200 before you watch my videos and read my articles about Hummels. You are making a lot of mistakes. Same thing with Capa de Monte. Pyrex is hot and so is Milk Glass. There you go. What sites are best for reselling things like this? There are lots of different sites, but you have to know the, the values before you start, right? So you want to do a couple of things. First of all, you want to watch the videos. You want to think about a 30-minute video call with me because I can go through a lot of stuff, have everything out on a table and measured. And then, of course, I'll tell you, um, you know, this is this piece is worth this. It will sell best here. That piece is worth this. It'll sell best here. Here's an example. You know, you want to know what everything is and you want to know the value. So, you know, it's like when you buy milk, you don't go to the car parts store to buy milk, right? So if you want to sell milk, you probably don't want to sell it in the car parts store, right? You want to probably sell it to a grocery store or that kind of thing. Or you want to sell it to somebody who's very thirsty for milk. So how do you find those people? That's knowing as much as you can about the actual object. So for instance, you said Hummels and you said Capa de Monte and you said milk glass and you said um, and you said sound equipment. You're not gonna sell the sound equipment in the same place that you're gonna sell the milk glass, okay? It's not a one-stop only selling event. So I want you to understand how, what the nuances are and how do you negotiate? How do you learn how to do it? Where is this information? It's here and I can always also help you with specifics. But for example, if I were gonna sell a piece of if I were going to sell a piece of milk glass, I would probably start with the places where milk glass is going to be most, you know, desirable. Thank you, May. So, for example, milk glass is going to be popular with weddings usually, right? So now you're going to look on some of those sites because those white milk glass um, vases are oftentimes very desirable and people look for them. Um, if I were going to sell milk glass, I probably wouldn't sell it on a site like, let me think. Like, um, I probably wouldn't sell it on a site like The Real Real or Poshmark because they kind of focus on jewelry or accessories, not typically sort of home pieces. So I might look at other sites. I might look at Ruby Lane. I might look at Etsy. I might look at Shop Thrilling because they like, of course, vintage pieces. So it depends. It depends. But again, it's not one place. Oh, that's the place to sell everything. That's never the case. So. And remember, estate sales, they can be done. They can be done smart, and you can do very well. I have a lot of tips on my blog about, of course, selling your pieces, downsizing, and decluttering. So I don't want you to forget that either. Thanks for that great question and for the super chat, too. Is gold tone costume jewelry most often gold filled or a composite that looks like gold? Dawn, smart question. It can be gold plated. It can be gold filled, right, which is vermeil. It can be actually something that looks like gold. Now, if you go to my website under research and you look for gold marks, I actually give you uh, an article where you can actually print it out or save it to your phone or take a screenshot of it. And basically it tells you this mark, this means this, this mark, this means that, this mark, this means this on costume gold jewelry. So you can't, you can't beat it. You can't beat it. It's right there. So, and it's easy to find. Look under the research. You see the big eye for information. You see research, go to that. Click on that at drlaurieb.com, and when you get there, you're going to be able to choose jewelry. So click on jewelry, and then go from there. I built this monster of a website. It's a monster, and it's so much information. And everyone says, I didn't have any idea. You did classes. You did video calls. You have a, a website that has so much information on it that actually is helpful because I want you to succeed. I know you can do this. And many of you have told me, you know, hey, Dr. Lori, you know what? You changed my life. 
I hated my job. I quit my job. I watched you. I followed you. And now I'm able to actually be a reseller or I'm collecting. I was collecting all the wrong stuff. And now I'm collecting beautiful pieces. I talked to a gentleman named Jerry. Um, uh, maybe it was last week. And you know, he said, Dr. Lori, I just did an experiment is what I did. I watched your videos for two weeks and then I went to an estate sale and then I had a video call and I realized that just in a little bit of investment, I was able to get very valuable pieces because you taught me how to identify quality. You can do this. I can help you. Okay. I've made my point. I've made my point. <laughs> I'm sorry. I want to, I want to get to your questions. I didn't mean to ignore your questions. If she doesn't answer you, she did a video where a lady had shooters. You might want to look for it. It has marbles in the title. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, uh, here's an example where Alisa, uh, Alicia is trying to help. Yeah, um, if I didn't answer you. First of all, I answer everybody. I'm, I mean, many of you will see, if I'm sending an email back to you, you know, you, you will see that basically I am answering. And if, you know, basically I'm answering the, the Facebook you know, I'm answering Facebook. For example, someone said, I can't find the Coffee Grinders article. I put it up on Facebook. You know, I'm answering the questions. I'm answering the YouTube questions. I'm answering you if you send something to the, the, um, the website. I'm answering you on video calls. So, yes, and you have to do a little bit of searching. How hard is this? Go to the top of the YouTube channel, and it says search. Type what you want in there. Do you think I didn't cover it? I've covered it. Let me tell you. I've seen it. I've covered it. It's there. And if you use the binge link, I have staff who are basically working their tails off to create things like binge links for you. So you can just binge them. So it's really easy. So you're not trying to search for stuff. You can just go one after the other. But if you're looking for one specific thing and you're trying to hone in, you can go to the search either on drlorivee.com or on the YouTube channel and search for it. And thank you for the help in, it says shooters in the channel. It says shooters in the title. Just put in marbles, put in marbles. All the marbles things are going to come up, right? So that's the beauty of the internet. You know, that's the beauty of the search features, the beauty of the search features. So great. A lot of things, a lot of things, a lot of very, very busy weeks. So great collaborations this week on YouTube with other YouTubers. Um, yeah, thank you, Blue Set. I appreciate that. I, we really, I really do try to get back in quick fashion if I can. Um, sometimes I'm doing something else. Sometimes it's as simple as, oh, I went to the ladies room. <laughs> sometimes it's as simple as I'm taping something or I'm on a show or, you know, that, that kind of thing. But yeah, um, usually we get, uh, we get back pretty quickly. And if it's a staff thing, you know, if it's something that, you know, oh, well, I had this video call and I got a question about a schedule or something like that, you know, they're better than I am actually. They're, they're excellent. So they get back fast too. Um, don't forget, you know, we're not relaxing around here too much, but when I do relax, I do watch a lot of old and vintage, I don't know, everything's kind of old in my life, <laughs> um, including me, <laughs> a lot of old and vintage TV shows. And what's really funny is when I see a show that I'm watching that maybe I'll just be clicking and I just go, okay, let's put this down for background when I'm doing something else. But um, a lot of these shows have works of art that, you know, you're just thinking, how the heck did that did that piece get into Gilmore Girls or Downton Abbey or Royal Pains or Frasier or whomever, you know, any of those old vintage shows that actually show these particular types of things. And it's really funny because I would like to know, for those of you who might have an in, whether or not you've seen some of these shows that actually have something that relates to thrifting antiques and such. For example, I was watching Royal Pains and one of the characters actually was bubble wrapping something and i i was sitting there going oh they're gonna do it wrong and they didn't they didn't so the producer or the writer the screenwriter or some one of the you know the copy editors the script editors actually knew the right way to use bubble wrap and i gotta tell you there's not a lot of people who know that so i thought that was great when the character actually got that right so much fun um what excited me Oh, I have so many stories, Lily. I've seen so many beautiful pieces. I've seen so much stuff. I've seen so much junk, but I've seen a lot of stuff. I do have an amazing treasures video, um, amazing finds. They're, they're pieces that came into my events. It's right there. Um, you can search for that those videos. Um, but when I think of some of the most unbelievable pieces, I think of uh, some of the private appraisals that I've done. I think of pieces like uh, Leonardo da Vinci that the people didn't realize they had a real Leonardo da Vinci. I mean, you'd expect that in, in their house. Um, I think about paintings. I think about some of the great and cool pieces. 
pieces that are one of a kind. I think about the thrift store piece that was a Dale Chihuly, you know, that was sitting on a thrift store shelf. I mean, how do you donate a Dale Chihuly sculpture of glass? I mean, how does that happen? But it does, it does happen. Um, let me think what other pieces. Um, the photographs from in the Enola Gay, which of course, the war plane that dropped the bombs during World War II. Uh, someone brought the photographs, actually one of my events. Um, a $150,000 painting that was bought at an auction for $5 came into one of my events, an impressionist painting. Um, uh, a Tiffany lamp that I will never forget uh, that was wrapped in a cat's bed. So the Tiffany lamp was actually came into an event and it was wrapped in a cat's bed that had fluffy on the side. You know, L.O. Bean, those cat's beds, and it's a little bed for your cat. And it basically says, you know, you know, fluffy, you can embroider, you can have them embroider the name on it. And uh, this gorgeous Tiffany lamp, Dragonfly Tiffany comes out of it, uh, worth a lot of money, um, you know, you know, six figures easy. So, I, I mean, beautiful, wonderful things and pieces that are just amazing, a seed pearl heart-shaped pin gorgeous piece of jewelry that um was given to this person's relative from queen victoria herself that was amazing to hold in your hand it had been on the body of queen victoria and it was given to one of her ladies in waiting and then handed down in the family came into one of my public i mean my god i got a thousand of these stories and i've got a thousand of the real bargains which are your stories that i retell too so that's great Yes, he has a Herman Miller Eames chair ottoman. And he Frazier also had, thank you very much, Jackie. He also had a great African art collection that a lot of people just overlook and think, well, we don't know what this is because he's so like elite and frou-frou. But that's a wonderful collection all over. Um, he also has um, a great Coco Chanel, of course, atelier sofa or re reproduction of that. Um, yeah, that, that was a good show for, uh, you know, design, if you will. You know, Florence Knoll, who was known, of course, Knoll International. Florence Knoll could have walked onto that set. But there are a lot of them in a lot of these shows. Um, I wrote a book on a sculptor named Seymour Lipton, and I was watching Gilmore Girls on reruns one day. You know, my uh, nieces were in the in the room, and they said, oh, we'll watch this. And all of a sudden, I look up, and as they're walking through Yale, and you know I was at the Yale Art Gallery, uh, one of those Lipton sculptures that, you know, I studied was there, on actually on the set where, um, oh, what was her boyfriend's name? I don't remember her boyfriend's name, but the blonde kid was Rory's boyfriend, was walking past and I was like, that's a Seymour Lipton abstract expressionist piece. It was in my dissertation and in my book. But anyway, blah, blah, blah. But there are a lot of them there and I'm glad that you noticed them too. Downton Abbey is full of a lot of art, a lot of art. You're still telling folks to read the syllabus. It's in the syllabus, Deb. Well, Deb must be a university professor like me. I oftentimes have said, you gotta read. You got to read the syllabus. The other things you have to do, I know it's a busy life. I know there's a lot to do. I know you're really busy. I know you've got kids and grandkids and this and that and, you know, responsibilities galore. You got to stop and you got to read. You got to. You got to just stop and read. A lot of the reasons why people are making mistakes or why you're, you're not benefiting as much is because you're not reading it. And I know. I get it. I'm busy, too. I mean, I make mistakes. I miss stuff. I go, oh, yeah, they did tell me that. Oh, you know, but... You have to really sit down, slow down, and take a read. And take a little time for yourself. If you love this and you think it's fun, why shouldn't you have some time to yourself to enjoy this? What is folk art? All right. Mo, this is a good question. So a lot of people will say, you know, I like folk art. Folk art is oftentimes um, art that is, in fact, indicative of a particular culture, right? So it's usually of a particular culture. So it might be something like a Pennsylvania Dutch hex sign would be considered folk art. Or maybe it would be a, um, a hand card duck decoy might be considered folk art. Um, sometimes quilts are considered folk art of a particular time period. So those are some of the examples. If I had to give you a list of folk art, those are some of the examples. Characteristics of folk art doesn't mean that it is of this sort of higher echelon. It doesn't have to necessarily be um, sort of in this environment where people will say, oh, you see this all the time. But folk art is oftentimes representative of a particular time period and a particular place. Um, and you have fewer of these well-known artists in the folk art communities. So, well, what do you mean? Well, you might know um, you might know an artist like Jack Savitsky, who's a relatively well-known folk art and 
northern northeastern Pennsylvania, who was well known for drawing images of, in fact, um, coal miners, right, and that kind of thing. But that's indicative of a particular place. You're not going to see his name be as well known in places like, I don't know, uh, Tucson, Arizona, or um, California. So this is what I mean when I look at, when I think about folk art. Think about place. Think about not all that highly recognizable names of the artists. Not, oh, there's Picasso, there's Renoir, there's Matisse. I know them and everybody knows them. It's not like that. Look for aspects that relate to a certain place, time period, or what's important to a culture, right? And then folk art is oftentimes very, very desirable and collectible. The collectors of folk art are they're intense. They love it, you know, and I love it too. Thanks for that question. So could outsider art be considered folk art? Well, it could be. I think outsider art has more of a political statement. Um, you know, to call someone an outsider is a little bit different than to say, you know, folk art. Um, could it be interchangeable? I guess it could be under a particular umbrella. I like to give outsiders, if you will, and I don't think that's a bad word. Um, I like to give outsiders a little bit more credit, right? Um, than to say it has to be under folk art. Otherwise, we don't understand what it is. So I like anybody who's trying to make creative pursuits and they're doing something that, in fact, is trying to teach the rest of us about their point of view. I like to know what their point of view might be. Um, Stuff that's kitschy. So, well, kitschy, I kind of think of as if you had a, um, a pink refrigerator in the 1950s. That's more kitschy, right? Um, so, and folk art tends to be uh, indicative of, again, a particular group, community, and such. Kitschy can be a lot of different things. Kitschy can be uh, a, I was talking about and getting ready to do a, uh, some segments on uh, lunch boxes. Kitschy can be that or something. What's something you wish you would have been the one originally? Okay. What's something you wish you would have been the one originally appraised? For instance, the ruby slippers. I did appraise the ruby slippers, in fact. <laughs> um, I was asked to appraise those. Um, and there are a couple of different, um, there are a couple of different uh, pairs of the ruby slippers, if you will. And I was actually asked to appraise those. Um, what's something that I wish I had been the one to appraise? I mean, I've appraised a lot of fantastic things. I don't sit here and go, oh, I wish I appraised that particular thing. You know, I've appraised wonderful pieces of fine jewelry. I've uh, art, art to beat the band, you know, wonderful painting sculptures, architectural elements. Um, I appraised um, pieces that relate to big names like Picasso and, and Leonardo and Frank Lloyd Wright and... I don't have a lot of, I don't, I'm not a person who does the, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I feel so bad. Oh, I regret this. I regret that. You know, I've been blessed. I'm lucky. And I love all of you. And I love that question. And Matthew is always asking great questions. And Matthew's always supporting the channel. So thank you so much for that. I appreciate that too. But yeah, um, if there's one thing I've missed, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what that would be. You know, I, I think, I think these pieces are wonderful. You know, I worked in private collections with pieces like, you know, big pieces by George O'Keefe. You know, fantastic pieces. So I love it. Native American is that folk art. Well, Native American pieces have a, have enjoyed a wonderful, pardon me, Native American pieces have enjoyed a wonderful and longstanding and well-deserved history, whether it's squash blossom necklaces or whether it's Pima baskets or whether it's, um, you know, uh, clinket, uh, totem poles, whatever it might be. So yeah, Native American pieces I, I think those will always hold their value very, very well. I love to see them. I've appraised a lot of that stuff, a lot of Native American pieces too, a lot of Native American art all over the world, all over the world. Questions are great. Thanks so much for yours. Thanks for your super chats and super stickers. Um, again, collaborations are coming. Um, don't forget that, that newsletter because you're going to learn how to negotiate on this one. And I'm Dr. Lori. Thanks for being with me. Love you. See you next time.